Hello, you're watching People's Dispatch, and today we're going to be talking about a country which has undergone a, undergone a lot of tumult in the past one year, that's Tunisia. So in July last year, President Kais Said essentially dissolved parliament and began to rule by fiat. In September, he took over more powers. He's appointed an interim government. He's declared plans to hold a constitutional referendum this year and a fresh parliamentary elections. Recently, he dissolved the Supreme Judicial Council, which is a very key part of the structure, the state structure in Tunisia as well. So to talk about all this, what are the implications, why this has happened in the first place, we have with us Father Lideza, a journalist, a researcher, and also founder and founder and editor-in-chief of Meshkal, an independent media platform. Father, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So could you first take us through, I think, one question many of our viewers might have, which is that uh, last July onwards, there's been this arc of actions by the president every few months. He seems to have taken some more power, seems to have taken some more, you know, uh, some more abilities from the constitution, so to speak. So could you maybe first take us to the broad arc of what his moves have been in the one year and what seems to be the plan? Sure, yeah. In, in July uh, 25th, when he dismissed parliament um, or froze parliament, he said he had suspended it, he dismissed the previous government. Um, he had initially indicated that this would be a temporary move, that this would be uh, within um, uh, the constitutional uh, article um, that would basically allow him to, to do this for one month. Um, there were quite a few people who uh, detracted at the time and said this was not constitutional. But at the time, he had what seemed to be broad support because uh, there was quite a lot of anger at the previous parliament for various reasons, particularly uh, what had been seen as a total failure uh, with the COVID crisis, um, but also um, many other deteriorating issues uh, from health to transportation, et cetera, et cetera. But since then, he's uh, actually extended it. Um, in September, he, uh, as you mentioned, he, he took more powers, um, basically suspended uh, almost uh, all of the constitution and decided to, to start uh, ruling by decree. Um, in the meantime, um, we've seen that um, his political opponents uh, have uh, been uh, uh, targeted uh, one way or another. Um, some people would say that this was um, sort of expected that the, the previous car parliament had had been uh, corrupt. That's uh, one of the, the very widely perceived uh, issues that uh, people had seen it as corrupt and that uh, there were people in the parliament that uh, did need to face justice. Uh, so the fact that they lost their immunity, they lost their uh, from parliamentary immunity, did leave them open to prosecution, including cases that um, had to do with um, you know, criminal charges uh, prior to them becoming uh, parliamentarians. However, we did see that the priority seemed to be the, that the Kais Said and uh, his government were going after people who were particularly uh, critical of him and his government's moves. Uh, so that's certainly been a concern of human rights advocates, uh, of lawyers. Um, and then just recently, we've seen him uh, uh, basically dissolve the Higher Judicial Council, um, which had been in charge of appointments of the judiciary. Um, the Higher Judicial Council took many years to set up. It was sort of one of those efforts after the revolution in 2011 to try and bring uh, some independence from the executive branch to the judiciary. Um, so it was very tentative step uh, in creating that independence. And now even that very small tentative step seems to have been reversed. Absolutely. Of course, in this context, uh, you know, there have been, for instance, a lot of critics uh, from the beginning call it a presidential coup. And over time, we've seen a lot of civil society organizations, even trade unions for that matter, hard in their stance, even some of whom were initially a bit, you know, willing to give him a kind, some kind of leeway. But we have now seen that many more have taken to a more oppositional stance. But the key question here I also wanted to ask was that, you know, what has been Kaya Said's support base, so to speak? Because I believe even when he was elected in the first place, it was a bit of an amorphous, uh, you, know, he's, you know, he didn't particularly have a political party per se, it looked like, and it was a bit more of an amorphous support base. So in these moves, what has largely been the kind of people who have backed him and section? Sure, yeah. His, his political campaign in 2019 was, was very strange, unique. I mean, he didn't have a, a political party. He didn't have anything that looked like a political organization behind him. Uh, it seemed to be sort of very ad hoc. Um, people who had been uh, who had known him personally, who were organizing his, his election campaign, he had very little media coverage. Uh, it seemed to be former students. He, uh, President Kai Said, had been a lecturer uh, for, for for decades uh, in constitutional law. Uh, he had quite a following among his students, uh, admirers, um, including also uh, some colleagues who, who admired him. So that seemed to be the sort of the, the core of his support base. And, and actually, uh, since he's uh, taken more powers, we've seen that a lot of his appointments have been from academia. People he's, he's worked with seems to know personally. 
Um, but in terms of uh, his support base uh, since July 25th, I mean, we saw uh, most of the parties uh, were, were really sort of against this, particularly the largest party in parliament, uh, the Anahta party, seen as an Islamist party. Um, but uh, we did see some support from uh, sort of an Arab nationalist uh, movement. Uh, we saw um, sort of some leftist parties taking sort of a, 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 were on the fence at the beginning. They, they, they didn't really take a, a very strong position against him. Um, but since then, we've seen more and more parties uh, basically uh, criticizing the president, saying that they supported the July 25th moves, but they don't support the extended sort of um, uh, concentration of powers under the executive, and particularly um, uh, what they see as uh, uh, increasing repression, um, uh, particularly um, we've seen of journalists, we've seen uh, uh, less space for um, freedom of association, particularly in the capital. Um, and we've seen uh, that uh, even parties that hadn't been working together have started to work together saying that they are there against the president. Uh, but even if the entire political class has been uh, against the president, it's taken a little bit longer for, for civil society to sort of uh, um, try and act as an opposition uh, to, to the president. Uh, we have seen some unions taking some, some positions. We've seen particularly the journalist union has on occasion uh, 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 really uh, uh, condemned uh, the presidency and called on the presidency uh, to really be responsible for some of the assaults on uh, freedom of speech that we've seen. Um, and we haven't seen a strong position from the UGT, which is the main national trade union, um, but uh, they may take a stronger position now as the, the government negotiates a deal with the IMF. Uh, that seems to be maybe a red line for them, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. In terms of support, the president without a party has been uh, relying almost uh, uh, exclusively on the military and on the police. Um, and so even even when he when he said he was going to dissolve the higher judicial council, he, he did it at an announcement in the interior ministry. Uh, so he had not uh, really uh, brought in his justice minister to, to make the announcement. Um, the justice ministry is part of the executive branch, and you would expect that this would be maybe the mechanism that is used uh, to sort of reshape the judicial branch. But no, he went to the interior ministry, which seems to be his sort of uh, 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 strongest and last bastion of support. Um, certainly, you know, when he, when he gave the, the orders to the military to, to, to freeze parliament, the, it was the military that was standing at the, the gates of parliament to, uh, to, to block people from, from coming in. Um, and uh, uh, it seems that uh, um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, he may have some support within the security forces, um, but it's unclear if, if that support will also last uh, as, um, you know, they have their own grievances as well. Um, and they may uh, see themselves as, as above even the president. And oftentimes security forces say we are um, Republican uh, forces or we try to be Republican forces. Uh, we are above uh, political parties and, and partisan interests um, and, and oftentimes see themselves as quite immune. I mean, they, they, they're also immune from, from, uh, from judicial procedures. We see that there's quite a lot of impunity among security officials. Very few, if any, have been um, prosecuted uh, for crimes since the revolution and before the revolution. And, 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 and particularly uh, when we saw that there's quite a lot of violence during the revolution. Absolutely. Right. And key, another key moment, of course, has been his declaration that there's going to be a constitutional referendum, uh, which will be followed by parliamentary elections, of course. So is there any indication of how he plans to, you know, what he plans to do with the constitution, how he plans to redraft it since the constitution post the revolution was considered a very landmark moment in Tunisia's history? Yeah, I mean, the constitution seems to be um, uh, the president's main focus. Um, you know, we haven't seen, you know, since he was elected in 2019, um, we saw very little uh, input from the president on uh, on laws. He proposed uh, a few, if, if any, I think. Uh, he, he, he may not have proposed any laws uh, during that period uh, from 2019 until he, he took greater powers uh, this last July. Um, and then and then we've seen that his main focus since uh, July 25th has been on uh, rewriting the Constitution, um, changing, changing the system. You know, as as a, as a sort of specialist on constitutional law, this had been something he had been uh, 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 quite um, uh, focused on even before. I mean, during the uh, just after the revolution, he was a commentator on national TV talking about the Constitution. He was a big critic of the Const new Constitution writing process after 2011. Um, and he really has uh, uh, sort of uh, um, disliked the parliamentary system, seen it as sort of a, a reversal or uh, a betrayal of the revolution. He says that he's correcting the, the revolution. 
Um, he, he seems to have uh, uh, very strong ideas on the electoral system. Uh, he would like to see an electoral system that maybe even changes uh, the system towards a more decentralized system, uh, maybe a, a system of uh, local councils that will eventually have representation at the national level. Um, but so far, these have all been fairly vague. Uh, he is now uh, basically launched an online consultation, uh, which has had very low participation rates, uh, uh, extremely low. I think it's in the, uh, um, uh, I haven't checked the latest numbers, but I believe it was even in the single digits after uh, a couple months of being on, uh, online. Um, that people were not participating. Um, you know, when you look at the questions, there's sort of multiple choice questions about uh, extremely complex and uh, wide ranging issues about uh, sort of the legal system and the constitutional system um, that doesn't seem to lend itself to a multiple choice uh, question. And, and uh, at the same time, uh, it seems that the low participation rate means that people have either said, um, um, whatever input we have will not matter. I think there's a suspicion that the president will sort of do what he wants regardless. See, that's certainly how he's been ruling since July 25th, uh, with very little input from other groups within uh, civil society or other political parties. Um, and so, so uh, when they're doing this online consultation, whatever the results of it may be, um, the, he has said that there will be a referendum in this, uh, this summer. Uh, on that to sort of change the political system, probably to change the constitution and uh, the electoral uh, system. But where it goes from there is unclear. He has said that there will be elections, uh, 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 legislative elections uh, in December. Um, I, we see that some people are, are sus suspicious that it will happen at all. People are, are sort of doubting that given the fact that uh, so, so many of the president's decisions have, have, uh, have not uh, followed through, particularly with his commitment to, to temporary measures that have actually not been temporary. Absolutely. Right. And Fadil, coming back to the issue you pointed out earlier, which is that of the IMF loan itself. So uh, could you also tell us about the context in which this loan is being talked about and discussed, especially considering what has been the broader economic policy framework of Tunisia since the revolution? Does the IMF loan, for instance, mark an intensification of those policies? Is there any kind of break that we're looking at? So how does, how does that fit in here? Sure. Uh, well, um, it's important in the context here because from um, 2013 onwards, um, you know, this is really when the IMF uh, basically uh, got involved uh, much more uh, uh, in Tunisia with uh, uh, a few loans from 2016 to 2020. They had a, a quite a large uh, loan by Tunisia standards. Um, and there was, there was some debate at the time whether Tunisia actually needed um, that loan, um, you know, the debt to GDP ratio, um, you know, hadn't been too bad, you know, just after the revolution, it was about 40%. Uh, but now since then, with the IMF loan, it's gone up to, to, to about 100%. And, and actually, the repayments um, uh, um, have, have sort of gotten out of hand, um, debt repayments have gotten out of hand. Um, and at the same time, since the, the, the last loan by the IMF ended in, in 2020, uh, we have seen um, that uh, Tunisia's credit rating has been being downgraded. Uh, so there's a real uh, pressure from international creditors um, and lenders and donors um, that Tunisia sign a new deal. Um, Tunisia hasn't been able to, to sort of uh, uh, get uh, financing on international markets without this loan. Um, and that's starting to have effects. We're starting to see that, in, for example, in December, uh, there were several shifts. Uh, with uh, uh, cargoes of wheat that um, it took, there was quite a long delay uh, before that they, uh, they, they released their cargo. Um, and as a result, we're, we're seeing as that that is probably one of the reasons why we're seeing food shortages. We're seeing um, uh, bakeries uh, that are increasing the prices of subsidized bread, saying that they can't get access to subsidized flour. Uh, we're seeing bakeries that have limited amounts and will only open for uh, a couple hours in the day with long lines of people outside of them. This seems to be worse outside of the capital. We've seen some of our uh, uh, reporters uh, going outside of the capital to different places and seeing that the problem is, is actually much worse at bakeries outside. And of course, bread is, is sort of the staple um, in Tunisia rather than uh, uh, rice or some other product. Um, and so there seems to be quite a lot of pressure. Now, there's been negotiations before. The previous government was negotiating before with the IMF, and that was sort of uh, paused after uh, Kai Sai uh, came to, to power. Uh, but now we're seeing that um, uh, th there's quite a lot of uh, pressure. Uh, we've seen a big um, a letter by, by quite a lot of people in, in, in the U.S., uh, Middle East experts um, and uh, former ambassadors saying that they would like to see the IMF loan uh, not be given uh, or that they would uh, until 
uh, they see political reforms back towards democracy from uh, the Syed presidency. Um, so that certainly puts the pressure up on him, particularly as people are really start, starting to feel the pinch, uh, both with food, um, but uh, um, you know other subsidized products. Um, and of course, the IMF is demanding uh, a freeze on public sector hiring at a time when there's there's quite a need for doctors, for example. There's 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 uh, very few doctors. We saw that during the COVID crisis. Um, they're also calling for a a, a freeze in uh, public wages, which again might be a red line for the unions. Um, but definitely, there looks like uh, more austerity that's uh, likely to come, uh, regardless um, whether whether the whether the deal is signed or not. Uh, uh, it does seem to be a continuation of increasing austerity measures that we've seen, um, basically from 2013 onwards, and, and maybe even a bit uh, before that. Right, and this is even as I believe there have been massive protests in Tunisia, especially in certain regions, because of the high rate of youth unemployment as well. Sure, I mean, there's been, uh, um, you know, not necessarily linked to, to the post-July 25th scenario, but um, for, 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 for many years, we've seen yes. social mm -hmm. movements, um, uh, particularly in regions outside of the capital that see themselves as uh, marginalized, that see themselves as not benefiting from natural resources, whether that's uh, agricultural resources or even oil and gas resources, that they don't see that reinvested back into their communities, uh, whether that's in terms of transportation, um, hospitals, uh, schools, but also in terms of uh, jobs. Yes, I mean, youth unemployment in some areas is, is close to 50%. Um, and as a result of that, we've seen people um, you know, migrating. We've seen large numbers of Tunisians uh, going for informal migration um, to, to Europe on, on very dangerous journeys. Um, and that problem has only increased in recent years. Absolutely. And Father, finally, a question on uh, the point you just mentioned in the pre previous answer, which is about democracy itself, because uh, across, uh, across the world, for that matter, Tunisia, was known as one of the few countries which is able to tide over the initial banks post-revolution, build a system which, of course, had a number of problems. There was chaos, a lot of parliamentary elections were held uncertainty, but nonetheless managed to keep that system intact and running until 2021. So how do the developments of July and since actually, what kind of an implication does it have for the legacy and the structures that were built during this period from 2011 onwards? Yeah, unfortunately, I think uh, post July 25th has really revealed um, how um, sort of the democracy uh, narrative and the celebration of democracy was a bit not just premature, but I think was 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 ignoring some of the fundamental problems um, and and really the lack of democracy. I mean, you can have a parliamentary democracy, which we saw, uh, but without the, without the parliamentary democracy actually um, uh, uh, being responsive to people's needs. Um, you know, those structures uh, were seen as, 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 as quite uh, uh, useless in actually uh, uh, responding to, to people's demands. And more than that, I mean, the laws that have been or, or the measures that have been taken since July 25th, particularly the repressive measures, a lot of them are using laws that were on the books that, um, you know, the parliamentary democracy never um, reformed. So whether that's a, uh, an extremely repressive penal code, um, you know, that, that basically criminalizes uh, insults to officials. Uh, or insults to the president. Uh, you know, even the previous president had had uh, gone after, uh, and actually, pre previous two presidents had gone after uh, people who had uh, targeted the presidency uh, for cartoons and for other sort of uh, uh, public speech issues. Um, you know, in terms of uh, police reform, you know, we saw that the, uh, in fact, um, you know, the transitional justice process after 2011, looking at state abuses going back 50 years, um, was not only stalled, but was attacked by uh, other institutions of the state, was um, uh, sort of um, justified in sort of these partisan bickerings. But the, the net result was that you didn't see uh, uh, almost anyone, um, you know, uh, seeing jail time or restitution or paying back uh, for some of the, 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 the crimes uh, pre-2011 and even, even after 2011, um, you know, police seeing themselves as above the law. I mean, at one point, they had even gone to a, a courthouse that had been held, holding uh, 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 police uh, on, on accusations, um, uh, and, and they basically freed their colleague under pressure. So you could see that there was a growing tension between the police and the judiciary, that there was, there was no real will to sort of have um, uh, justice for um, um, sort of the violent repression that the state had uh, visited upon uh, people, particularly uh, on, 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 on ordinary people, on, on, on poorer regions, on poorer uh, neighborhoods, uh, something that we saw even as recent as um, uh, 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 you know 2019, 2020, we saw you know mass uh, arrests. We saw uh, right. um, particularly going into into to neighborhoods where where young people would be targeted. People would 
you know, just go into to, to poor people's uh, uh, homes uh, uh, and, and sort of do uh, uh, sweeping arrests without uh, uh, sort of any sort of um, uh, collective punishment uh, for any sort of uh, um, uh, conflict between uh, people and uh, security officials. So I think really July 25th and, and sort of the, 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 the steps we've seen ta taken since then have, have really revealed something that was rotten at the core and, 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 maybe, and maybe exacerbated it as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Father Eliza, for talking to us and giving us such a, a concise and clear explanation of what's happening in Tunisia right now. We'll get back to you more to talk about this. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch. Thank you.